Um, this is a part of my research on Orson Welles that I started three years ago. And uh, yeah, I thought it was a good opportunity for me to continue um, because I have already written a book about the unfinished works or the minor works of Orson Welles. And I'm, I was mostly dealing with archives <coughs> and uh, especially with some films that uh, uh, we call phantom adaptations, like Heart of Darkness, I'm going to talk a little bit, and um, especially Don Quixote. Uh, and uh, so uh, in, this, uh, in this context, I was examining all works of Wells that uh, are not considered uh, the master works or the principal works. And uh, here I'll be talking mostly about Orson Welles' radio and how it relates to, um, to one of the most important films of uh, film history, Citizen Kane. And uh, yeah, it was a, a good opportunity to talk about this uh, radio show, Dracula. It is, the, for me, the, one of the, the best works of Orson Welles. And uh, I'm really glad to talk about it here in Transylvania. <laughs> it seems very opportunistic. Okay. I want to intertwine three aspects of the connection between Bram Stoker's novel Dracula, Orson Welles' radio shows, especially the Dracula 1938 CBS broadcast, and Citizen Kane. The first track turns in the, into, uh, in the psychoanalytical and mediatic implications of Dracula's story and legacy. The second one in the radio broadcast Dracula and its remediation of the original intermedial novel. The third in, relation, in the relation between space and narration in Wells' radio shows, Death of Sound, and its relationship with formal narrative devices of Citizen Kane, like deep focus and reflexivity. Meanwhile, I want to present you here some cuts I've made in the original Wells show. Maybe I'll be turning around in an endless loop. What is at stake when we talk about a certain count named Vlad Cepesh, right? Cepesh. Cepesh. Uh, from the land behind the forest, or Transylvania. What is at stake when we talk about Dracula's legacy? What is at stake when we think about the way one media sucks the blood of another media, creating the so-called intermediality, mixing and thus prolonging our pleasure, our jouissance, with certain cultural and technological gadgets? Novel, cinema, gramophones, typewriters, iPhones, iPads. Let's say, to begin, what is at stake if not the stake itself? Let's adjust our ears, or as, as James Joyce says, let's make the optophone on the fame. When the count of the Middle Ages coming from the whirlpool of civilizations, this is uh, how uh, Bram Stoker called Romanian. Uh, when the count of Middle Ages coming from the whirlpool of civilizations arrives in London, he supposedly is bringing a plague to modern civilization. Such plague consisting in attacking young and beautiful women of the Victorian era in order to bring them immortality or pleasure of dying and becoming undead. Listen to the night attack of the vampire to Mina Harker. <coughs> oh, sorry. 
To terminate such parallels, enemy Dr. Seward and Dr. Van Helsing, both initiate, initiated in the mysteries of the recently invented discourse network called psychology, are called to accomplish their duty as sanitarians of the empire against the plague. What is at stake if not the risk of seeing women's pleasure and desires being emancipated and against it to reimpose the phallocentric order of the empire. Henceforth, it's the empire against the vampire. So what is at stake is none but treading deeply a stake in the heart of darkness. It's all mother of stakes, from Vlad Chepes, or the Impaler, to Kurtz, the main <coughs> character, of Joseph Conrad's novella, sticking and impelling many skulls or corpses of barbarians as a sign of the empire's power or lack of power. Orson Welles' phantom adaptation of Heart of Darkness was refused by RKO producers for its technical complications, but also because of its rare combination of self-reflexivity and critique of imperialism, and also because of its multiracialism. If Heart of Darkness became a phantom adaptation, it doesn't mean that it stopped weeping at the cemetery of Hollywood. As a vampire, the spirit of Heart of Darkness flows inside Citizen Kane and thus contaminates the whole industry of entertainment. I think I don't need to prove here how much Citizen Kane has influenced not only the way American cinema was made since the Second World War, but also the way it had a strong impact in European Nouvelle Vague and even in André Bazin's film theory. In Heart of Darkness script, or Wells acted as the same, as, at the same time as Kurtz and Marlowe, reinforcing the ambiguity of Conrad's novella, about the feelings and intellectual adherence of Marlowe to our Kurds. Wells reinforces the ambiguity also in the use of an entirely subjective camera that embodies Marlowe's sight. Actually, we never see Marlowe entirely, except, except parts of his body or his shadow. Thus, Wells reinforces the question of point of view, creating a device of identification, identification that explains to the American viewer how easy it is to identify yourself with Nazi or a fascist. Dracula is not an accident in Wells' career. There is a strange line of continuity in the strong, diabolical, manipulating and powerful characters he has chosen both to interpret and direct in his stage, radio and film productions. <coughs> His theatrical debut in Bright Lucifer, 33, when he was only 17, was the embryo of the late representation of evil forces in Broadway productions, like Macbeth, Julius Caesar, and Faust. The combination of power and manipulation is also determinant in the case of Orson Welles' film's debut at RKO, first with his phantom adaptations of, uh, adaptation of Conrad's novella, Heart of Darkness, Second, with Citizen Kane, whose character not only satirizes media tycoon William, William Randolph Hearst, but most especially criticizes the fascist mode of media control in America, something Wells intend to show already in his famous broadcast, The War of the Worlds, 1939. If media is the blood of democracy, or the veins where freedom of speech flows, media tycoons might be considered as the vampires. Now, coming back to the psychoanalytical implications of Bram Stoker's Dracula, Friedrich Kittler remembers us that as much as the sanitarians Dr. Seward and Dr. Van Helsing, the psychoanalysts Dr. Freud and Dr. Jung admitted they were also bringing a plague 
to America that would emancipate women's desires and prepare the advent of the last master, namely Jacques Lacan, who would not fear the stakes and crucifixes of Dr. Seward's and Dr. Van Helsing's and would redeem women's from phallocentric empire. This is the one side of <coughs> Dragula's legacy, if we follow Friedrich Kittler. The other side is the remediation of Bram Stoker as a long tradition of vampire or opier stories that precede Stoker's novel, including lesbian vampire stories by Goethe, Die Braut von Corinth, and Sheridan's Le Fanu's Carmilla. The history of remediation of Bram Stoker's novel is inscribed in its own intermediate possibilities. Stoker has had a great commercial, commercial success with the novel, not only because at his time vampire stories and imaginary were trendy in London and in Europe, but because he condensed ingredients of modern technology with romantic imaginary, like Gothic plots travel to distant countries here by by the way, young ladies sharing intimate confessions, premarital love intrigues, male <coughs> heroism against evil forces, and even, even balcony love scenes, though between uh, vampires and to be married, respectful Victorian ladies. <coughs> Bram Stoker anticipates much of what we call now entertainment. So it's not by chance that it will be one of the most adapted and remediated authors of the 20th and the 21st centuries. Amid the mass of adaptations and recreations of Dracula, Orson Welles' radio broadcast occupies a singular place. Welles was certainly aware of Murnau's Nosferatu and probably had seen Todd Browning's 31 first sound version of Dracula with Bela Lugosi. But none of these adaptations preserves the main feature of, feature of Bram Stoker's novel, the use of several media for the frame, frameworking of narrative and for creation of suspense. The interest in terms of novelty in Bram Stoker's novel is not the vampire itself, but the way he presented it to readers. <coughs> not only by using several points of view, but the implication of these points of, points of view with their respective media. Thus, mediation and point of view becomes the key to enter the amazing novel, which is a maze as much as it is a novel. The novel begins with Jonathan Harker's journal, written in shorthand, that means with stenographic technique. Later, we will discover that the actual journal was transcribed by his future wife, Mina Murray, in her typewriter. Then we have letters changed between Mina and Lucy. We have telegrams, sheep log, logs by captains, phonograph diaries, news from newspapers, and even the telepathic transmissions of Minas during an hypnotic trance. This is the first thing Orson Welles preserved in his remediation of the novel. Somehow he felt that the interweaving of several kinds of media and the different points of view were essential to the narrative. So let's hear another. The Mercury Theater on the Air presents Orson Welles as Count Dracula in his own version of Bram Stoker's great novel, Dracula. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Arthur Stewart. I'm here tonight to bear witness to the truth of certain events which you may find it hard to believe, but I ask you to believe them. I have kept certain documents, telegrams, clippings from the press of the day, memoranda, and letters in various hands. All needless matters have been eliminated. Through the history, almost at variance of the possibility of contemporary belief, may stand for a simple fact. I present you first with excerpts from the private journal of Jonathan Parker. I, Jonathan Parker, lawyer of class, Peter Hawkins is quite a back to the English and writing this journal in the hope that it will be fortunate of the technique. You probably will recognize if you if you have seen many times Citizen Kane, <laughs> some of the voices. They are all the actors of Citizen Kane, including Orson Welles. Um, 
If we come back to Bram Stoker's novel, we will discover the mutual implications of media and narrative from the one side and from the uh, other side between media and the unveiling of the case in Dracula's detective subplot. When Mina, Harker's, Mina Harker enters for the first time in Dr. Seward's room, she is not only interested in consolate or seduce, according to the way we read, the young widowed man, but to help uh, by all means the, uh, to find the good clues to find the criminal. Everybody is potentially a Sherlock Holmes in Dracula. Mina's curiosity fascination for, uh, and fascination for new media <coughs> as typewriter and gramophone is her way of expressing herself as a modern woman. She creates a space between her position as a housewife and a detective, especially because his husband, Jonathan Harker, grows weaker and weaker as the narrative evolves. Uh, now we... Um, yes, up. There's a, uh, I would like to read uh, this uh, moment when the, she's, she um, meets uh, the gramophone for the first time. After I tidied myself, I went down to, down to Dr. Seward's studio. At the door, I paused a moment, for I thought I heard him talking with someone. As, however, he had pressed me to, quick, to be quick, I knocked at the, at the door, and on his calling out, come in, I entered. To my intense surprise, there was no one with him. He was quite alone, and on the table opposite him, was what I knew at once for, from the description to be a phonograph. I never seen one and was much interested. I hope I, didn't, uh, I did not keep you waiting, I said, but I stayed at the door as I heard you talking and though there was some thought that there was someone with you. Oh, I replied with a smile, I was only entering my diary. Your diary? I asked him in surprise. Yes, he answered. I keep it in this. As he spoke, he laid his hand on the phonograph. I felt quite excited over it and blurted out, Why? This beats even shorthand. May I hear it so say something? So she's very enthusiastic with the gun. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Mina Murray finds a way to be in the middle, that is to be a medium, between the new media and the vampire. This is why Dr. Van Helsing, who becomes more and more his psychoanalyst, decides to take advantage of the situation, transforming media in a medium, in a media, to read the Count's intention. In other words, as Kittler would say it more emphatically, Mina becomes the first encrypting and deciphering machine, and Bram, Stoker's, Bram Stoker is preceding Alan Turing mm -hmm. in the chain that binds media, cybernetics, and war. Let's hear it. No. During morning before sunrise, just before sunset, she speaks to Van Helsing. In the trance, are you with him, Nina? Tell me, are you with him? I am with him. What can you see? Nothing. Oh, yeah. What can you hear? So Dracula is traveling to, uh, back to Transylvania, and but this, the blood in of Mina is in his veins somehow. So she's uh, she's kind of seeing things. The phonograph invention is closely related with immortality and the preservation of the voice of the dead. Phonograph itself is a kind of vampire. Thus, no place would be better for Bram Stoker's novel than a radio broadcast. And the wunderkind Orson Welles knew it well when he was hired by CBS to write, direct, and act in a series of Sunday radio shows with no necessity of including the sponsor's name. This was far more important for Wells' career than the late contract with RKO that originated Citizen Kane. 
there was no precedent. Okay, there was no precedent in radio story for something alike. Usually, all radio shows should include the advertising of the sponsor within the voice of the host, as one of the famous was Bob Pepsodent Hope. Bob Hope was the name, and then Pepsodent was the product. Uh, not only at the beginning, at the end of the show, but twice in the middle, during episodes of 15 minutes. Mercury Theatre in the Air, or First Person Singular, was supposed to be not only longer than normal radio shows, almost one hour each episode, but in it Orson Welles could figure himself as host and sponsor, and also as a narrator and an actor, and sometimes playing several roles, as here he is Dracula and Dr. Seward at the same time. This is why, as Margaret Rippey affirms, he created a label of himself in the entertainment industry. A label which is more than the, f that the figure of author. This is important because there is the whole discussion about the author in the Nouvelle Vague and the uh, uh, critics of Orson Welles think that he's something more than an author because he's an actor also. Uh, it is, was not by accident uh, this, this shows called First Person Singular, as well as radio hosts used to enter in the middle of the broadcasting to broadcast to advertise beer of or toothpaste. Orson Welles enters in an intrusive form in the narrative to create a direct dialogue, dialogue with listeners about what they are really hearing. He uses the strange strategy, frankly, uh, the same strategy uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt used in his famous radio broadcast, Fireside Chats in the 30s. This fact will be used uh, by Wells to blur the boundaries between fiction and fact, between falsehood and truth, and will create the famous case of the War of the Worlds, which is the consequence of Dracula. So this is the end of Dracula. I'm almost on my end, too. Tonight's production of Dracula by Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater was the first of nine TBS broadcasts in which this brilliant group would bring to life a series of great narratives, all presented in the immediacy of the first person singer. In presenting them each Monday evening at this time during the summer season, the Columbia Network is bringing a complete theatrical producing company to the air for the first time. And now here is the director to tell you about next week's Mercury Theater production. Mr. Orson Welles. Ladies and gentlemen, what are your favorite stories? If there's one you're particularly fond of and would like to hear on the air, will you please write me about it? Next week, the Mercury Theater is going to tell you Robert Louis Stevenson's exciting yarn about pirates and the sea, Treasure Island. Until then, just in case Count Dracula is that you a little apprehensive, one word of comfort. In a good bed tonight, don't worry. <coughs> Put out the lights and go to sleep. It's all right, you can rest easily. That's just the sound effect. Yeah. Oh, then, Shadow Team? Nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. I think it's nothing. But always remember, ladies and gentlemen, there are wolves. There are vampires. <laughs> Such things. <laughs> Chosen to be the first of many radio shows, um, Orson Welles and his uh, something. Orson Welles and his teams worked hard in Dracula to create the basis of all subsequent shows, which will be the basis of Welles cinema. The team featured actors from uh, Mercury Theatre, famous stage director John Hausman, and music composer Bernard Herrmann, Herrmann, who will be engaged by Hitchcock lately and popularize Wells' idea of music and affects. According to James Nairmore, Mercury radio shows would hidden behind the Gothic style a sort of New Deal populist urge, and quotes, uh, he quotes him, uh, Wells defining the state of the medium in 1938. Radio is a popular democratic machine for disseminating information and entertainment. The high bros are still sniffing at it. 
But when television comes, and he said it in 38, when television comes, and I understand that is not far off, they will be the first, in all probability, to hail radio as a new art form. Orson Welles, uh, Dracula's uh, deep sound anticipate much of Citizen Kane's deep focus. But how is it possible to affirm such incongruence? How is it possible that some sound form relates to an image form? The link between two media is depth, and depth is space. Uh, so uh, I, I stop here because I, uh, I continued uh, showing how this depth, the use of depth in uh, radio shows of Orson Welles is the same uh, of deep focus in Citizen Kane. So uh, I don't know if I have enough time, so uh, I, I would prefer if you have some questions and uh, to discuss a little bit because uh, my, the final of my paper would basically try to show the relationship with Citizen Kane. Maybe you want to hear something more. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes? Uh, regarding uh, to uh, cinema adaptations of Dracula, like Mugnaus uh, Nostrato and Todd Browning's uh, Dracula, uh, interests me uh, the relations that uh, the vampire establishes with Mina through telepathy, like some sort of media and there are, there are uh, new technological, there are new theories so, or, or ex esoteric theories that say that uh, maybe uh, telepathy or extra natural or extra natural communication is some, is some sort of media like the, the spiritualist religion in, in Brazil, yeah. as you know it. Um, and what do you think of, of how this these filmmakers uh, treated media in relation uh, in, in regarding this the this telepathic communication with cinematic language like the the, the cinematic montage the Le Racor, the Le Racor and things like that so, so uh, how do you think of it I think that I'm basically trying to 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 say that there is no uh, such media awareness, both in uh, Murnau and in, in, in Ted Browning's, and in most of uh, Dracula's adaptation, except the, the Coppola's. Coppola's uh, adaptation is really, uh, he shows the typewriter, uh, he shows the gramophone, but, um, so uh, the, the thing is, te uh, telepathy, the thing was hypnosis. No, yes. uh, I like very much uh, Friedrich Kittler's text uh, on Dracula because he says there is a strong relationship between the, the birth of psychoanalysis, all this spiritualist trend at yeah. uh, the, the end of the 19th century, um, and the question of hypnosis and the birth of this new, tech, new media like uh, gramophone. And uh, gramophone was invented to to preserve uh, the voice of the dead. This is this was the main idea of creating gramophone. Uh, so this this was uh, very important at this moment, at this point in Europe. And uh, uh, so the, the 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 main issues was not telepathy, it was hypnosis. Uh, there's a book of Stefan Stefan Andreopoulos about the relationship about telepathy, mediums, and uh, spiritualism, and uh, this new media at the, the, uh, uh, the end of the 19th century, too. So, uh, yes, there, is, there are scenes of telepathy in uh, Murnau's. Uh, no, I think that in all, all films, uh, almost all the, the adaptations preserve this uh, this scene, but in in uh, if you read um, Bram Stoker's novel, uh, there is much more. Much more. Yes, I think it was somehow it was uh, um, all this mediatic and uh, spiritualistic and psychoanalytic side 
uh, was somehow hidden in most of the adaptations. Okay. Yeah, okay. I have a comment, and uh, there is also a question working behind it. Um, the thing is, uh, you just mentioned Francis Ford Coppola's adaptation of Bram Stoker's Dragon. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is another medium that you should have told that, which is cinema. Mm -hmm. Because there is a scene that obviously couldn't be written in uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula because, you know, the scene was where it hadn't been invented yet. It's a scene where uh, Lucy, Lucy, yeah, mm -hmm. Lucy goes to the movies with uh, the younger Dracula. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's a passionate scene, but uh, it's also uh, a scene where we get to, to see the new media. And so it's, it's important because it's not in the novel, and if it's brought into the film, mm -hmm. it needs to be because there is another explanation for it. And the explanation is totally intermediate because uh, the couple was not just trying to uh, go further than the novel does as far as several medias are concerned, but he's also um, making a point, which is, uh, this is an allegory of spectacle and uh, precisely an allegory of cinema. And so that's why he brings all you know, this totally uh, unnecessary scene into the film. And we talked about uh, Heart of Darkness and Donkey Shot, particularly. And so I think that there is a relation between what Coppola intended to do, uh, intended to do and actually did uh, in the film Dracula, and what uh, Orson Welles also intended to do and actually did, although the film was not completed, but somebody else did it, so we can actually see it in DVD right now, mm -hmm. and uh, which was to have a medium uh, predate another medium. So Don Quixote is a self-reflexive novel, mm -hmm. as you know. And uh, Orson Welles is also a self-reflexive attempt to reproduce that novel. Mm -hmm. And we can actually see him interacting and uh, scenes, etc., etc. And so it seems to me that there is a relationship between this couple's version of Draco and uh, Orson Welles' version of Don Quixote. And I wonder, if you have wondered, mm -hmm. uh, whether if Orson Welles uh, could have lived more you know, longer, you have actually conceived it. Yeah, actually, it that way. yeah, actually, uh, Coppola in the, the beginning of the 70s, he tried to to hire Orson Welles, and um, uh, he knew about uh, Orson Welles' attempt to make <coughs> Heart of Darkness eventually, and uh, Apocalypse Now is uh, almost based in this, this attempt of making this. Uh, of bringing this novella to the cinema. And uh, yes, uh, I, Orson Welles' a big characteristic is this media awareness. And the way he was trying to, he was trying to, to, um, to show to the audience, to Americans, how much media awareness was important, especially during the Nazi period. This is the, uh, the basic motivation of the War of the Worlds. He was trying to show, hey, uh, media can manipulate you. If you believe in it, uh, you, you can be uh, cheated by media. Uh, this is why we hear at the end of, uh, when Dracula returns at the end of the, the show, he says, this is just special effects. Nobody will say this kind of things in a radio show in America in the uh, late 30s. It was forbidden. You should never say, that, hey, because radio was like television. Often the archives, that everybody now is working with the undiscovered Orson Welles since 10 years ago. So everybody is dealing with archives because there is no sense of working with the, the master, the finished works. Uh, it's like uh, if you work with the finished work, there's, you, you, you continue in this. Uh, uh, way of interpreting works and genius and so it's very romantic and now we are more and more entering the archive because if you enter Orson Welles archive you enter somehow in the American industry because he was always fighting against the industry so I think it's far more interesting to work with archives and so on. <laughs> Thank you very much, Adam. Okay.